to that what all these proposals here in this exhibition suggest there's in a way when we looked back into political theory the post catastrophic my um, uh, consciousness is one that basically gives up because there's there's a gap between consciousness and understanding the political so the political doesn't resonate in the present state so and then Oliver invited me or anyway this invitation came out of a conversation that we realized that we read the same book 25 years ago, I guess under different circumstances <laughs> and in different contexts. But uh, so it kind of made me think of going back a little bit of what were milestones in how, what by then uh, I was very much kind of driven by the idea of sustainability. You know, it's kind of no go word in our days, but by then it was really something uh, we thought it's, it's important. So I thought I'd go back to that and kind of combine it also uh, with some projects I did, but also with some books and uh, other things uh, that came up on the way, basically. Um, yeah, but I think in a way the most striking part for me is if you look back into the history a little bit of climate activism, as also this uh, exhibition suggests, we do see a gap. Um, that is my question, which is not formulated yet as a proper paper, so it's questions I share. Uh, why we see a delay within the kind of hegemonic shifts in the contemporary art field. And I think it has certain moments I will also bring up um, that we are now speaking about it and not, as we could see, like the first book was published, or the first book I refer to was published, let's do it like this. Uh, it's better. Um, in 62. Um, so let me start with this. It's The Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, and I'm mostly concentrating uh, on the Northern Hemisphere. So that is maybe to be very precise. Uh, a book that caused one of the kind of um, a very significant environment movement in the US. It's also followed by a kind of certain, that certain pesticides weren't allowed any longer. So this book is now 60 years old. Um, and then, 10 years later, uh, The Limits to Growth were published um, by the Club of Rome. It was a study by the MIT. It was the first com com computer world studies of how the world would look in 100 years uh, if one could, would continue as mentioned in 1972. And it was clearly stated um, the world would be very much different than 100 years if you basically followed that model of growth. Um, um, yeah, so that basically led to, um, in 1992, the, the new um, limits to growth were published, again by the Club of Rome, and that, not led, but it was part of a discussion, it started in 1992 with the Earth Summit, also known as the Rio Conference or the Agenda 21 which in the German-speaking context is a completely different matter. Um, but, uh, and that conference basically marked a change in the way of how um, basically, politically speaking, beyond also kind of national borders, people would think about the, what, we, what even then by then was called the climate crisis. And I think one important part of the conference was, and it's the last paragraph, is the kind of representation of non-governmental organizations, but also the representation of indigenous people who would speak up at this conference about their climate concerns. So we talk about 1992. So 
to jump into the present and see in the art world how we now refer to indigenous practices. But it is the answer to this. So I want to I come back to that later. But I think this conference marked a kind of milestone in the way of how internationally the question as the limits to fossil energy, we see the militarization of fossil energies in the current war, uh, in the current Ukrainian war, um, the limits to water, etc., the question of biodiversity, etc. So in that sense, um, uh, yeah, so that's and Five years later, and here we come to the book Oliver and I read at the same time in 97, which is called Zukunftsbild uh, Deutschland. Uh, one could translate it in a little bit kind of futuristic. Futuristic? No. Yeah. Yeah, from Germany. But, I mean, what is interesting here is, I mean, the book is a very technocratic book. It's a proposal of basically how to translate. That was discussed. Uh, five years before, into a kind of governmental program. So it was published by the BUND, which is a kind of environmental NGO in Germany, uh, and NISERO, which is a kind of Christian organization. I think this is interesting to understand, uh, together with the Wuppertal Institute, which is an independent environmental kind of institute. Um, at the same time, of course, I came out to make a proposal, the critique came out. So what we also see is so these kind of like let's say more state level NGOs were encountered by the more grassroots organization who criticized the concept of what was by then called the so-called third world or two developing world, which we now discuss as the global south. Um, that this concept lacks any understanding of the so-called global south and kind of deepens a division between the north and the south instead of overcoming it. So I think it is important also, and when we look then a little bit later, to maybe question around the current documenta. What I'm trying is, of course, also bringing it a little bit back to our question here, which is the, the contemporary art. Basically, one key point of the book, Sustainability and Power, which is the, the left book, is um, the question of social justice. So what it basically says that the concept so far as discussed by more technocratic approaches is missing the idea of social justice. Um, which I think in what we can see here in the exhibition is very central. So it is not just about kind of environment, it is it's also about social justice. So in a way it's something that I think it's also stated in the core text is basically how go should we go beyond just the, what Nancy Fraser uh, calls or she's quoted calls the merely environmental approach. So where do we basically look for intersectional approaches? And I think this is the key point of our time. How do we think together? How do we think an environment struggle together with a maybe post-colonial struggle, anti-racist struggle, anti-sexist struggle? So how do we bring these struggles together as a kind of shared ground? Of course, there are differences, but most of all, it is a shared ground of struggle. And what is interesting that at the same time discussing these books, like at least when I, well, that was the time when I was studying, that it's kind of, Feminist ecologist would be totally against like what we make, what is again also in a way a suggestion of this exhibition, the overcoming of subjectivity. So, for example, one key argument was say that a lot of by then environmental activities, for example, separating trash, is something that is uh, related to female reproductive labor. So, it's put into a certain area where basically women are responsible for, and we know all this kind of mother earth and kind of feminization of the discourse. So, so in that kind of, let's say, emerging climate of what we might understand as sustainability, and it was very hard to define it, and it still is, I guess, um, we tried to basically found a kind of sustainable board at the university. And in a way, we established it, but we failed, because it was too early. Today, you have this kind of people who are responsible but by then it was just, I would say, literally too early because it was there and we didn't know what to do with it. So, but um, well, at the same time, and now I'm coming to uh, maybe jump into what happens parallel. And what we see is um, a shift in the art world, uh, in contemporary art field, that sees emerge, of course, of the globe. And in a way, I mean, going back to, to 
the conference, conference was also something that was related to the kind of end of the Cold War um, in Europe. And let's say, or in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, because there was a different kind of political situation in the world. And at the same time, we saw a hegemonic shift in the art world also with the fall of the Iron Curtain and how a more global idea of what art practices are emerged. So, for example, um, this day is this, uh, there is a documentary 10, created by Catherine David, who basically gave, I mean, she gave a retrospective to art practices in the 20th century um, by also just suggesting to read it as a kind of global art history. So, in a way, she basically set the ground for them later, Documenta 11, which was the first one which really marked an hegemonic shift towards post colonial practices. So and that is uh, it's a coincidence, but there's a work by you see a work by Tunga, a performance here at Kutuba and Hopi Castle, while at the same time a year later, in 1998, uh, Sao Paulo Bayanya also kind of marked a shift by concentrating on Brazilian history and the concept of antipofania, which is basically kind of a concept that is a cannibalistic concept by understanding the post-colonial context, so that you take the culture of the colonizers, you basically eat it, digest it, and you bring your own culture out of it. And so that was a moment when, it, in the history of the Sao Paulo Bayern, we basically, again, shifted to an, understand, an emancipatory understanding of Brazilian art. While at the same time, and that's maybe not that well known, is that in the kind of, what we see also in the 90s is the pioneerization of art around the world, especially in Asia. Um, so is the, is the Shanghai social, um, uh, is this was the basically between um, 1992 and 1998, it was founded as a kind of anti-Bayern. It was basically relating everyday art practices uh, to the everyday in Southeast Asia. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is the picture here above uh, to the right. And it is something I think it's very important to understand how there are already collaborative practices, practices of networking, practices of friendship played a key role to how they conceived art in Southeast Asia in the, in the 90s. And I will come back to that later because I think it's also important maybe for the current debates around Documenta 15. Um, so and it was a network of international artists which might have not been recognized by the rest, but it marked the shift within Southeast Asian art. And there's, in this interest of understanding sustainability, maybe only through the medium of an exhibition or through artistic practices, um, uh, I cooperated two exhibitions in 2007 and 2008, so we are now 10 years later. Um, one was in Vienna, and uh, it was called Nachvollziehungsangebote, um, which in a way was playing around the idea how could we communicate sustainability? How do we make it possible to understand what it means? Because it became a kind of anti meta narrative. Uh, in, by then, also a lot of kind of catastrophic climate talks. So in a way, the, the second exhibition, uh, Catastrophe Alarm, referred to this kind of media hype of what was called natural catastrophes, Naturkatastrophen, which became the word of the year in Germany in 2007, which in itself is a contradiction because nature doesn't have catastrophes in that sense. So it is the climate survival of the humans who kind of experience it as a catastrophe, but not the nature itself. So we were actually looking back to that discourse, which is quite old when we look into the history of painting. Um, uh, at the beginning of the world, is where you would kind of find these paintings of what is called natural catastrophes like fire or floods. So at here to the left, you see a work by Ursula Piman, the Black Sea Files, which was a question about the pipeline in the Caspian Sea, which is an interesting moment of, we, again, in the kind of literature, Militarization of the fuel crisis, which already was asking about these gas pipelines, and also about infrastructures. So, I think one also interesting shift we see in the current contemporary art discussion is the shift from what was in, back in the 90s an institutional critique to an infrastructural critique. That was my uh, 
uh, timer, 20 minutes. Oh, I'm going to finish it soon. <laughs> we made that joke, so I took it serious. I thought I could not have it myself. But I think it's as well because this kind of project is now basically discussed in the larger picture as the new Silk Road project in China. And it kind of brings back the kind of global understanding of these infrastructure projects. Um, and as Oliver as man, was, man, as man, was mentioning, uh, I was working in Singapore for, the past, uh, for, for about five years. We initiated a project, we again followed that question of, of nature and culture. And we called it Acts of Life, Nature and Urbanity. And we took through kind of very thriving, uh, very generic urban environments. One is Singapore, and the other one is Manila. It couldn't be more different in terms of how uh, basically urban development is performed, but it was interesting to understand the kind of intersection of urban transformation, digitality, nature, and culture, which is in this kind of sense of Asian futurity. Uh, kind of is very different you know, also a way of the way you would understand the dis maybe the distinction between nature and culture and where it's not distinct anymore. But I would say in a, it is in a way how a modern and a contemporary tradition comes together. And it's very different to maybe how we would discuss nature and culture as, con as kind of cultural concepts. Um, and here you see a uh, a picture of this uh, Future City Lab, which is basically a project by the ADH of Zurich, together with the National University of Singapore, where they basically research materials and architecture, research uh, the change of temperature, which kind of is um, important for the region as it's tropical, uh, to kind of monsoon rainfalls and how to kind of avoid water masses within urban contexts. So, and what this project was basically a, crit uh, a critical research residency. So what we tried was we were inviting artists uh, to come to Singapore and Manila and to research and work with us and together with the Museum of Modern Art and Design in Manila and the um, Research Center for Contemporary Art and UCC in Singapore. And so it's also, we didn't expect to have really works, but to develop methods and tools. And I think there's something also, but it's a question of this exhibition. So shifting to more of what could be an understanding and what was the role of an artist rather than the art itself. So, and how do we then train them on what kind of education strategies do artists develop uh, to kind of speak to a public? Um, and and last but not least, and um, I will, is, uh, the question of Lumbu, Naumong, and Harvest. Uh, so what basically was suggested by the current uh, documenter in Kassel and Juan Kupa as the artistic director. So we invited them to side school uh, to, give two uh, to give a class in 2021 uh, about the idea of Lumbu. And, and this year we uh, kind of conducted the class in Kassel and called it Harvest to Harvest. So in a way, it is a research model um, of research, scoring, value, and perform. They're basically, I can't read it, it's too um, Basically, research includes observation, speculation, on mapping, on collecting narration. Then scoring, articulating to recent research finding, value, harvesting, compiling, and strategizing for articulation, and perform as platform of sharing. So, and what we see, I mean, in a way, it is now we see the shift toward the global south on, let's say, on, on, a, on, a, on the level of a large scale exhibition. But we also see the complexities, what I said, what kind of intersectionality is needed uh, to basically speak about. And of course, a lot of uh, practices at Documenta, and I don't know who's been there or followed a little bit the discussions, which are, there have been a lot of it. Um, how, um, and a lot of the strategies are basically about survival, but in a way that we might if we go back to the, to the, the Green Bible. 1997 is basically independent to any state politic. 
it is a survival of a communal kind of form of organization, and that is basically been shown at the exhibition. But then it's the question, if the medium of the exhibition, what kind of form does it have, and what kind of form these practices suggest to be exhibited? And I guess that is a little bit also besides other question of that documenta, one of the kind of, I guess, heavily discussed ones. For them, it's an exhibition, for some it's an exhibition, for some not, for some it's art, it's not art. So, so, um, yeah, maybe I leave it here. Maybe I give one more outside for an exhibition to come next year, so to go into the future. Is, which I think is interesting is, um, is the Dakar Art Summit. And I guess in this part of the world, let's put it this way, Bangladesh is widely known for France. Um, and even in contexts where you would expect a certain reflection on the, using these images that Bangladesh is connected to flats. And I can uh, talk about an episode that happened in Singapore when we talked to the German TV, and we said, yeah, but we, we can't talk about kind of cultural practice in the region. We normally are asked to talk about the catastrophes. So to kind of also give a certain image to, let's say, in German TV audiences. It's basically using the flood as a metaphor of talking about emancipatory practices in uh, South Asia. So kind of shifting that image to a decolonial approach, which is basically showing the richness of its cultures, which largely has been destroyed by colonial endeavors, by the destruction of uh, the cotton industries. Um, so, but returning these images, so to speak, to the center, and kind of creating something else. So maybe this, this as an outlook that what comes next after documenta, maybe in a similar approach of how to relate to current